He's been branded Australia's Hannibal Lecter, an opportunistic killer, a man with unspeakable obsessions. Is Derek Ernest Percy Australia's worst child killer? There are certain crimes where you go, oh, that is so terrible. The boy's body was found in this thicket of undergrowth. Imagine this child dead and mutilated. Does this stay with you? It's still there. What in the world had gone on in that man's head? They're dealing with someone who's obviously mentally disturbed. We asked the question, was he mad? Two minds, two people. Or just plain bad? We hope to God that there's no one else out there quite like him again. Warneet is on the foreshore of Western Port Bay, about 60 kilometres southeast of Melbourne. The small township is a popular spot for fishing, boating and holidaying. In 1969, it was exactly the kind of place that mum and dad could let down their hair and allow the kids to roam free with their imaginations. That is, until one day, in this quiet location, everything changed. It was an incredible time, really, that sense of freedom, uh, children growing up in the sun. Uh, most children of the time were able to, to play until uh, it got dark, and once the streetlights came on, they had to go, go home for dinner. Now, and two little children in this little windswept corner of the, the Mornington Peninsula wanted to go out and have a walk to the beach, uh, build a little bonfire. Shane Spiller picked up his neighbour, Yvonne Tui, took a little tomahawk with him, uh, to, to chop up the kindling. They were going to have a picnic lunch by the sea. Both families didn't think anything about this. You know, it was probably good for the kids to get out and get some fresh air. They went down a well-worn track. What they didn't know was that Derek Percy was down there in his car waiting for any potential victim to come along. 21-year-old naval cadet. Derek Ernest Percy worked at HMAS Cerberus. Percy was so quiet and unassuming that his Navy mates called him the ghost. But nobody knew the ghost was also a child killer. And he was about to commit monstrous horrors on 11-year-old Shane and 12-year-old Yvonne. What happened next? Percy confronted the children as they walked past his car. Um, he jumped out, grabbed the girl, asked the boy to come towards him. Little Shane Spiller showed a lot of courage in brandishing his tomahawk and said that he would hit him. Percy, being the coward that he was, backed off, but he kept Tui on a hold and wouldn't let go of Tui. Spiller had a split second to make a decision. So what does a little boy do? He decided to run in the other direction and get help. Well, but what does he hear? As he's running away, seeking help, he hears Yvonne's desperate pleas for help. Yes, she calls out to him, he's going to hurt me. Help me, help me. He's going to cut my throat, is what he heard. My name is Kenneth Scott Robertson. I joined the Victoria Police in 1953. I spent 34 years, less 12 days in the police force and rose to the rank of Chief Superintendent prior to retirement. Ken Robertson was working in the homicide squad when word came through that Yvonne Tui had been abducted at Warneet. Uh, the little boy that ran away who tried to prevent the abduction, Shane Spiller, he was very observant and observed a particular placard on the bumper bar of the car. It was the Navy logo, wasn't it? Yes. Police responded quickly. While detectives Robertson and Delaney drove down from Melbourne, police on the peninsula took Shane to HMAS Cerberus, 
where he pointed out Percy's Datsun 1000 in the car park. Having ascertained who the owner of the vehicle was, they went to his room and found him washing bloodstained clothing. I went and met the commander of the naval base and got his permission eventually to remove uh, this person, Derek Percy, from the naval base and take him to a police station. At this point, you don't know what Percy's done. No. All we know is that Yvonne too has gone missing. Was he cooperative? Was he throwing off? What was he doing? My impression of him was making out that he's been cooperative and he's making out he had a bad memory, which sort of convinced me he didn't want to help. Even though he was saying he wanted to help, he didn't want to help. Derek Percy was formally interviewed at Frankston Police Station by Sergeant Dick Knight. It's the only time that he would ever confess to anything. He was forced to retrace his steps from the naval base to the town of Warneet and finally to Ski Beach, where he abducted Yvonne Tui. He wore Derek Percy down eventually and Percy gave up and confessed. And it was rather a frightening confession when you think about it and look back on it. He'd done certain horrible things to the girl. He said he would be able to take us, the team, back to where the body was. Police directed the team to Fisheries Road, Devon Meadows, eight kilometres from where he'd abducted the 12-year-old at knife point. Once we got to the area, he knew where he'd been and what he'd done because he took us by stage by stage to where the body was and said, over there. She's over there behind those bushes. You see the body. I think you're almost the first to see yes, the body. Yes, yes. I've seen your pictures of her body and I'll never forget them. What did you see there? To put it crudely, not completely dismembered, but a very, very brutally damaged body. Some clothing on it, some not, some rope string tying her up, gagged, horrible wounds. You've seen a lot of things in the police force. I've seen numerous things, I've seen numerous bodies, and this is the worst. Does it stay with you? It's still there. We roll back to the first time you've seen Percy at Cerberus. Quietly spoken, timid, and you're confronted with what he's done. And you're saying, oh my God, look at the mess here. How could such a lovely fella 10 minutes ago have done this? So he had to be crazy. Had to be at the minute, at the minute. It was two worlds apart, which to me says two minds, two people. Mad or bad? Both. When police opened Percy's locker at HMAS Cerberus, they made a shocking discovery. He'd been keeping a diary where he recorded his sick and sadistic sexual fantasies. One of those fantasies involved a very young boy who'd been murdered and mutilated, just like Yvonne. And New South Wales took careful note because a very young boy had been killed in Sydney the previous year, just like that. Was this the work of Percy as well. So now the connections to other crimes begin to be drawn. And uh, an old friend of, of Percy's, who was, happened to be a police officer, Ron Anderson, was brought in. What happened with Ron? Ron Anderson was asked to go in and to talk to Percy to see if he would open up, because he wasn't really giving away any details to the hardened police uh, officers. 
Uh, Anderson came in as a friend and Percy immediately recognised him and uh, he said something quite um, significant. He said, looks like I fucked up this time. You know, this time. Coming up. The boy's body was found in this thicket of undergrowth. The horrifying murder of Simon Brook. It wasn't a quick death. Do you think Percy should have hung? Yes. In 1968, a year before Derek Percy murdered Yvonne Tui in Melbourne, three-year-old Simon Brook was abducted from his family's home here in the Sydney suburb of Glebe. He too was murdered and mutilated like Yvonne. So where was Derek Percy at this time? Living and working at Sydney's Garden Island Naval Base. Three-year-old Simon Book was playing in the backyard, which backed onto Jubilee Park. And it's believed that a, an offender came up to the fence. When the Brook family went inside to greet um, some family friends, uh, Simon disappeared. And whether the offender coaxed Simon through the fence or lifted him up isn't known. But uh, when the alarm was sound, there was a search party for the boy, and it wasn't until the following day that little boy's body was found in an adjoining block of land. The boy's body was found in this thicket of undergrowth behind a partially constructed building in Glebe Point Road. Imagine a boy as I saw him on Sunday morning dirty place under the bushes with old newspapers and this child dead and mutilated with blood on his face. Simon Brook had been asphyxiated uh, with a newspaper and post-mortem mutilated with a razor blade. The razor blade had been left at the um, crime scene and it was later discovered that the razor blade was a government issue razor blade. Now at the time, Derek Percy was a naval raiding working in Sydney at Garden Island. He was on leave on uh, that day in May when the little boy went, disappeared. Percy knew Glebe well. He often visited his father who worked there. After the murder of Yvonne Tui, Percy confided to his friend Ron Anderson that he'd driven past the scene of the crime on the day Simon Brook was murdered. The other thing is that when Percy's writings were discovered in his naval locker, he described the mutilation of a young boy. Admitting that they're dealing with someone who's obviously mentally disturbed, Police have issued an urgent appeal to any member of the public who may have seen a man acting suspiciously or have seen a man in the company of a small fair-haired boy in this Glebe area yesterday to come forward immediately. What were the similarities between what happened to Simon Brook and what happened to Yvonne Tui? The most important thing was the post-mortem mutilation. Percy was a coprophiliac. He had the unfortunate issue of becoming aroused when he spoiled his pants. And Derek Percy continues on. Where does he go next? Uh, Derek Percy relocated to uh, Cerberus in Melbourne. And he's there throughout the second half of 1968, which corresponds with the disappearance of Linda Stillwell. Linda Stilwell was the youngest daughter of an English immigrant family. They lived in St Kilda, and uh, the children decided, uh, as many children did in those days, to go out on a, a day's adventure, to, to go out and uh, have a look at the beach and walk around. Uh, during the course of the afternoon, they were separated. 
Uh, the oldest children went home. They thought the, the little girl was behind them. She wasn't. And when they went back to try and find her, when the parents said, look, go and get your sister, she had gone. Victoria Police launched a massive search operation for seven-year-old Linda without success. And for eight months, uh, from the disappearance of Linda Stillwell to the murder of Yvonne Tui, there were no advancements in that case. So when Percy's old school friend and police officer Ron Anderson visited him in his cell to discuss Yvonne Tui, he also questioned him about Linda Stillwell. And Percy made an alarming admission that he may have been driving through St Kilda on the day Linda disappeared. So he was clever enough to say, well, I may have been there, I don't remember. And that answer, I don't remember, I can't remember, became his refrain for the next 30 years. There was only one crime that Percy ever confessed to, the murder of Yvonne Tui. But he pleaded not guilty on the grounds of insanity and the jury accepted it. This meant that he was never convicted for her murder. Was that the right verdict? My, my own view is that there wasn't a basis for that verdict. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing was wrong. He didn't do it because he was driven by a, a psychiatric illness that deprived him of his moral compass or his capacity. Yvonne and possibly other children, they never had a chance. Murder was always the, on, the, on the agenda. Uh, and not just murder, torture. Torture and murder. Seeing a diary written by a man before the event where he detailed horrific accounts and then seeing the damage he caused that, that girl um, over an extended period of time. It wasn't a quick death. In 1970, Percy was found not guilty by reason of insanity for the murder of Yvonne Tui. He was sentenced to be detained at the governor's pleasure, which meant there was no set date for his release. However, if the jury had found Percy guilty of murder, he may have been the last person to hang in Victoria. Do you think Percy should have hung? On the basis of what was done, yes. To me, the insanity verdict stopped justice for other families who'd lost loved ones to Percy. I believe you're correct in that assumption. The jury's got to be blamed for this. Percy was never convicted of a criminal offence. Police investigating the murders of Linda Stilwell and Simon Brooke were unable to take samples of Percy's DNA to use as evidence. Why? Because he was never convicted in 1969. Police would have had to get his consent to take his DNA, and Percy never agreed. After the break... Percy was a very smart person. So he's Mensa class. Inside the mind of Derek Percy. One of the extraordinary things about his sadistic fantasies is how obsessive they are. When a Melbourne court finds Derek Percy to be criminally insane, he's sent to Pentridge Prison and put in G Division, populated at that time by all the prisoners who couldn't be classified like Percy. He settles into prison life so well, he's quickly given special privileges. 1969, where are you? 1969, I'm in Pentridge A Division. I'm working in a section where I'm called a writer. And there was a writer in each division? Each division had a writer. So how much work and authority would that writer have in a division in Pentridge? Total. The, the writer was the person who basically ran the, ran the division. So who was the writer of G Division? The writer was Derek Posey. Very, very young person to have a job like that. 
He was the person who made all the decisions as to what cell people went into, what type of amenities they had in their cell, what type of amenities were available to the other prisoners in the, in the jail, the rosters, the routine. He decided everything. So I met him a few times, and at that stage, when I first met him, he was no different. I never looked upon him as any different than anyone else. He was unremarkable. Totally unremarkable. Percy had no interest in his status within the prison. I mean, the only interest he had uh, was in being ignored. Paul Mullen is a professor of forensic psychiatry. When he started seeing Percy in jail, the child killer had been incarcerated for over 20 years. Mr Percy was not an easy man uh, to create rapport with. He is blank, dead eyes. My goodness, how am I going to deal with this fellow? It took a long while for him to even begin uh, to trust. He just had to sit and talk with him, talk with him about anything that interested him. He was fascinated by test cricket. He had a compendious knowledge of test cricket. So we chatted about cricket. My hope was always that at some point he'd feel able to talk more openly. And so I really, really wanted to know <laughs> what in the world had gone on in that man's head. Who was Derek Percy? Well, Derek Percy came from a, an ordinary uh, Australian family. A very strict father, absent father, uh, away working, and an overly protective mother. He was the oldest of three boys, but he was a loner. He was, he was an odd bod. He didn't have a lot of close relationships. His mother actually kept a very close eye on him. It's clear that he exhibited uh, certain behaviours at a very young age. Such as? Well, the first thing that came to note in the local community where he was living at Mount Beauty in Northern Victoria was that the female underwear was disappearing from the neighbours' uh, clotheslines. The second thing was that a number of dresses were uh, taken from the inside of houses, neighbouring houses. And two school friends of Percy's observed Percy in the bush in a place called The Gorge near Mount Beauty wearing these dresses and exhibiting violent behaviour in cutting the underwear. The, the stealing of ladies' underwear, snow dropping they used to call it. The issue was that uh, when he was uh, identified as the snow dropper, uh, the parents had an opportunity to get some counselling for him and they didn't. So that behaviour was normalised within Derek's family? It was. Then there was an incident uh, in his final year in Mount Beauty where he molested two young children in a caravan. They were the daughters of a neighbour and Percy's father, Ernest Percy, tried to smooth things over by appealing to the parents that they would get help for the son. It actually led to them moving away from Mount Beauty and going into New South Wales. Alarmingly, Percy's father already knew there was something deeply disturbed about his son. He had discovered Derek had detailed his evil fantasies in diaries. Instead of uh, challenging his son, he just destroyed them. Perhaps if there was action taken for the snow dropping or for the, for the, for the violent diaries at an early age, um, something could have been done. Percy continued to journal his perverted thoughts when he was in the Navy and also when he was in Pentridge. One of the extraordinary things about his sadistic fantasies is how obsessive they are, how detailed they are, and how rigid. Essentially, he had carried a complex sadistic fantasy life in a single stream, really from the age of mid-adolescence, I suspect, until the day he died. Having served in the Navy, Percy felt at ease with the hierarchy of the prison environment. The governor was ex-Navy, and so was the chief prison psychologist, Alan Bartholomew, who encouraged Percy to share his writings. 
he starts to share the details of this extraordinary, complex fantasy. And it's a disaster because it becomes knowledge both of the prison authorities and other people. That story was public knowledge throughout the whole prison. The whole prison was aware of that. And from that day forward, no one really trusted Bartholomew. Percy was a very smart person. His savvy IQ was up in the 150s. He's Mensa class. He's no do at all. No matter what they offered him, he never ever took the bait and revealed anything whatsoever. So Percy closed himself off to the prison psychologists, but amazingly, he still found a way to express his sadistic fantasies. A prisoner action group smuggled his writings out of prison into a couple of storage units that Percy rented. This went on for over 20 years until the day it came unstuck and the diaries were discovered. Next. The potential evidence found in this Melbourne self-storage warehouse could blow Australia's biggest murder mysteries wide open. Was Derek Percy Australia's worst child killer? This is the area where the two girls were brutally murdered. The Beaumonts is one of Australia's great mysteries. The potential evidence found in this Melbourne self-storage warehouse could blow Australia's biggest murder mysteries wide open. 35 boxes containing the diaries, files and sadistic thoughts of child killer Derek Ernest Percy have been hidden here for 20 years. The discovery of Derek Percy's hoard of material in 2007 led to a string of unsolved child murders from the 60s being reopened, including the Wanda Beach murders in Sydney and the disappearance of the Beaumont children in Adelaide. If Percy could be linked to these crimes, he would become Australia's worst child killer. Wanda was the first case in 1965, the murder and rape of two 15-year-old girls on Wanda Beach. This is the area where the two girls were brutally murdered. Mary Ann was attacked first, stabbed 17 times. Christine was chased down a knife seven times. Their bodies were buried in the sand. Police believe that Percy's grandmother lived in an adjoining suburb to the two victims in Western Sydney, and that Percy may have been visiting his grandmother uh, on that summer that the girls were murdered. This was 1965, and Percy was still at school. Those girls were coaxed into the sand hills. Those girls went into the sand hills for a reason. I doubt very much, speaking to Percy's high school classmates, that he would have had the inclination or the charm to coax those girls. He wouldn't have even had the guts to go up to those girls and introduce himself. So the idea that somehow this boy from Victoria hid in the Wanda sand hills, hoping that somebody would come past, that he would murder, is fanciful. And secondly, he wasn't interested in 15-year-old um, girls. The Beaumont kids. It's, it's such a, an iconic case in Australia. Every homicide detective in, in Australia wants to solve that one. It began with a troubling missing persons report at Glenelg Police Station late on Australia Day in 1966. Nine-year-old Jane, seven-year-old Anna and four-year-old Grant had been expected home no later than two o'clock. Well, you can understand Melbourne Police looking into the Beaumonts because you've got a case of multiple children being abducted from a beach. Percy said to his friend Ron Anderson that he thinks he was at the beach that day. But uh, a family member told me that the only time the family had been to Adelaide was on a cruise, and that they may have stopped off in Adelaide to have a look at Adelaide Oval because they were cricket nuts. But it beggars belief, you know, where does a 17-year-old boy on holiday with his parents hide the body of three children? Whitaker believes Percy was not involved in the disappearance of the Beaumont children. 
But what about Alan Redston's murder? The story of Alan Redston is a, is a tragic case. A six-year-old boy in a Canberra suburb is bound and hogtied, suffocated, rolled up into an old piece of cloth and left to die. The chief suspect was a teenage boy seen riding a red bike. Percy didn't own a red bike. It also seemed implausible, as at the time, Percy was living with his family hundreds of kilometres away in the alpine town of Cancoban. Yet, with renewed interest in all these cold cases, a special police task force was set up to interrogate Percy. Members of Victoria's Homicide Squad's cold case unit were in court this morning seeking access to Derek Ernest Percy. 59 years old, he's been in prison since 1970. Perhaps by some time this evening, we may have more information about what they've gleaned from Derek Ernest Percy. Percy told the cold case unit the same story he'd been telling everyone else. He may have been there, he just didn't remember. Investigators have long believed that Derek Percy killed three-year-old Simon Brook. In the year 2000, Simon's father, Donald, approached New South Wales Police to ask whether DNA science could be used to pin the crime on Percy. The answer was no, and there were two reasons for that. When New South Wales Police looked into the crime, they discovered, much to their disappointment, that most of the crime scene exhibits and material had been destroyed. So unfortunately, any hope of uh, using DNA was uh, nullified. Even if they had kept the exhibits, police would have been unable to take DNA from Percy because a jury found him not guilty in 1970. Of course, if you're found not guilty by virtue of insanity, then you haven't been convicted of a of a criminal offence. I've always thought it was a rather silly decision. Um, it always seemed to me it would be much better if you said guilty but insane. In my view, if Derek Percy were to appear before a court in Victoria today, he'd be found guilty. Despite the setbacks, a second coronial inquest was held into the Brook case. I'd like to say how grateful we are to the, the police and the judicial system for pursuing this, this business for so long. Percy was actually brought up for that coronial inquest, but Percy, once again, did not give anything away, could not remember anything, could not add anything to the investigation, and they just didn't have the smoking gun they just didn't have that one piece of evidence that linked into that case, and the case fell apart. Coming up. You really grew to like him, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened to Shane Spiller, the little boy who stared down Derek Percy? It's cost Shane his mental health, but he saved the community. Let's be clear. When Derek Percy killed Yvonne Tui in 1969, he was not insane. He knew exactly what he was doing. In 1998, after 29 years inside, Percy applied for the first of several custodial reviews. He wanted out. And the man who assessed him was Professor Paul Mullen. I would never have recommended his release. In fact, I'd have had an absolute fit if anyone suggested releasing him. Why? I would never, ever have been able to say to myself or anyone else that I thought he was entirely without risk of repeating event. Got to be absolutely sure with someone like that. I couldn't be absolutely sure. There was no place for Mr Percy in the community. It may have been very clear to Professor Mullen that Percy would never be released. But there was at least one person still living in fear. 
I'm on my way to see what happened to Shane Spiller, the brave little boy with a tomahawk who stood up to Percy, the little boy who ran to get help. Shane had a troubled life. He ended up living in the remote village of Wyndham on the New South Wales south coast. I'm heading to the village pub to meet up with someone who knew Shane Spiller by his nickname, Stig. My name's Mark Winterflow. I'm a retired detective sergeant. I retired in uh, 2014. I was a beagle, which is 30 plus kilometres from where we are. How often did you come to Wyndham? Uh, half a dozen times a year. Pretty quiet place? It is a quiet place, yeah. Which I guess has made a good place for Shane Spiller to be. This village was basically his family in so many respects. He lived alone, but he would go to the general store and here almost on a daily basis. And people kept an eye out for him and he was a, a well-known local identity. So how did you first meet him? I mean, I met him around about 97. When he showed me around his yard and his various equipment that it was in <laughs> all states of repair. Um, and he was an incredibly friendly, chatty sort of guy clearly quite sort of anxious and nervous, um, but gentle. Shane became increasingly paranoid when Percy was agitating to be released. He was openly telling people what had happened to him at Ski Beach. Because to me, the most dramatic moment in the story is when Shane fronts up to Percy with the tomahawk yes. and basically decides he's going to run for help. Yes. And he hears Yvonne's cries I mean, I would see it as survivor guilt. You're always going through your mind, what ifs, you know? Um, and realistically, if you had turned around and tried to do anything, we would probably not have the case we have today. Um, he would have died, you know, there's no two ways about it. Because Percy wanted to kill him, we know the intent was clearly that Shane was supposed to die that day. That was a mistake by Percy, that he's taken on two near teenager children who are obviously quite fit and feisty, and all he has is a knife. And he probably wasn't expecting a stick to have a tomahawk, so that's how we came unstuck. You really grew to like him, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a, a very likeable character. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't judge people that well, so anyone that treated him well became a friend. Whether you were a criminal or had other intentions, he was uh, very easily taken advantage of by people. A heavy dependence on drugs and alcohol fed Shane's paranoia. By 2002, he was suicidal. He tried to end his life with a plastic bag. He was admitted to Goulburn Hospital. He came out of there and he tried again with an overdose and went into Bega Hospital. And then he'd only been out of Bega Hospital a few days and then disappeared. When Detective Sergeant Winterflood began his investigation into Shane's disappearance, he heard that Spiller believed that Percy had ordered a hit on him from inside prison. So I had contact with Victoria Police. They arranged the armed offender squad to turn over his cell. There was absolutely nothing, no reference to Shane Spiller whatsoever. No, his other colleagues in the jail said he never mentioned the name. Mark Winterflood searched high and low for Shane. He even sent a team down a gold mine shaft on a rumour. However, no evidence of Shane Spiller or his remains were ever found. I put together a brief for the coroner at Bega with three scenarios. Uh, one was that he committed suicide, which would have been consistent with his most recent behaviour. One, that he'd uh, had an overdose with friends who had panicked and disposed of him somewhere unknown. Or the last one, that he'd been murdered, but I think that was highly unlikely. Shane lived with the horror of what happened to him and his best friend Yvonne on Ski Beach all his life. And the nightmare of that day was compounded by what police forced him to do after Percy's arrest. Now, Shane Spiller had to give evidence in the police station and had to go up to Percy's face and point to him. 
as was the custom of the day, as was the practice of the day. But that was very confronting for a little boy. Then he had to give evidence in 1970 at the trial and had to sit in the same room. To look into those dead, baleful eyes once would be enough, but twice. A psychopath has no empathy, so to look at them, that's what you see. It's just that empty, non-emotional glare. Shane Stick Spiller, the little boy with the tomahawk, really is the hero of this story. He's the brave boy who stopped Percy taking more lives. He clearly would have been a serial killer, would have killed more children if Shane hadn't seen and done and observed and given that evidence. So although it's cost Shane uh, his mental health and now his life, he saved the community. Still to come. It has been reported that he only has days to live. Will Derek Percy finally confess on his deathbed? Mr. Percy, did you abduct and murder Mr. Sewell? There are many who believe the disappearance of seven-year-old Linda Stilwell from the St Kilda foreshore in 1968 was the work of Derek Percy. To test that, the coroner called for a second inquest into the Stilwell case in 2009. A four-year battle began for Linda Stilwell's mother, Jean Priest, to force Derek Percy onto the witness stand. Round one went to Percy when the coroner ruled he would not compel the child killer to appear in court. We need to have some closure. And at the moment, I just feel as if he's laughing at me. When Percy sent Jean a bill for $32,000 to cover his legal expenses, there was public outrage. There's just no way that I can do that. He's amassed more than $300,000 in jail through a Navy pension. There should be a law that stops it. The state government won't get involved. Simple fact is it's before the courts and it's not appropriate for me to comment specifically upon it. Eventually, the Attorney General accepted responsibility, giving Jean an undertaking to pay all her costs. Earlier, Edith Jamison gave more evidence that she was the last person to see Linda Stilwell alive on the St Kilda foreshore that afternoon. She described having a premonition that something bad was going to happen to the girl. As Linda played, Ms Jamison says she recalls seeing a man sitting on a park bench watching her. These extrasensory things do frighten you, she told the inquest. The vibrations were coming from that man on the seat. It wasn't until Percy was charged for the murder of Yvonne Tui that Edith Jamison saw his photo in the paper. That's when she realised he was the man she had seen watching Linda Stilwell. Retired policeman Ron Anderson also testified. He'd been Percy's childhood friend, but in 1969, he helped get inside Percy's head. The homicide squad asked the young officer to go into Percy's cell and chat to him to figure out what made him tick. While in the cell, Anderson asked Percy about the disappearance of Linda Stilwell the year before. He told the inquest Percy admitted to being in St Kilda on the day she disappeared, but could remember nothing else. Do you think he was insane? No, definitely not. On no, no occasion he was distressed, but that's been wrong. Do you think he was distressed for the victims or himself? Yeah. Nothing for the victims, himself. Jean Priest was finally successful in her push to have Percy give evidence. But before he took the stand, there was a dramatic turn of events. Well, Derek Percy is being treated here at St Vincent's Hospital where it's believed he's suffering an aggressive form of cancer. Now, neither Corrections Victoria or Victoria Police will confirm the status of Derek Percy's health, but it has been reported that he only has days to live. 
At the 11th hour, Derek Percy agreed to be questioned on his deathbed by Detective Wayne Newman and Deputy State Coroner Ian West. I swear by Almighty God, I swear by Almighty God, that the evidence, the evidence I give in this inquest, that the evidence I give in this inquest, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Mr. Percy, uh, did you abduct and murder Mr. Sula? No. Percy was giving nothing away. So Wayne Newman showed him a road atlas found in his possession when he was arrested in 1969. Percy had made markings showing the exact position where Linda Stilwell was last seen. Do you recall me um, informing you that those markings were consistent with the search area of Linda Stilwell when she disappeared? Yes. He had previously told Ron Anderson he was there on the day, but now... Yes, that was my concern. I do. I was in Newcastle at that time. Percy wouldn't admit to the murder, but would he say where the seven-year-old's body had been disposed? Where could they find uh, these two? Uh... I have no idea. There was some consolation for the Stillwell family. In 2014, the deputy state coroner found that Derek Percy had abducted and killed Linda in 1968. Linda Stillwell's family cried and hugged at the coroner's words. She met with foul play, he found. Derek Percy was at St Kilda on the afternoon she was abducted and he caused her death. This has just been marvellous today. There's really vindication, I suppose, of, of the, uh, the efforts that have been made in terms of uh, the police investigation. There was some sort of closure for the Stillwells with that finding, but without a body, this will always be unresolved for the family. Percy died soon after his bedside interview in 2013. He was Victoria's longest serving prison inmate having done 43 years inside, and he held his interrogators at bay for every one of those years. How close did you get to any aspect of Percy's personality? For your life? Things like, what did he believe in? Did he believe in God? Did he believe in retribution? What insights did he give you? I have to say, over nearly 20 years, I never felt that I'd produced a kind of bond with him. I remember when I went to tell him that I was retiring and wouldn't be seeing him anymore, I was absolutely stunned when he started to cry. I, I found that quite distressing at the time. Yeah. And I think one of the things that that last interview told me that probably I hadn't done a very good job, uh, that if I'd realised that I was important to him a lot earlier, I could have gained a lot more insight. There's a man who'd been in prison his entire life, really, from the time he was 19 until, really, he died. He never had friends. I mean, he maintained contact with, with very few people, including the mother, and even that's perfunctory. It's not a warm, you know, wonderful relationship, but he has no meaning in his life. It seemed the only motivation for Percy was his endless quest to be released, which brings us back to the debate. Was justice served? by the court's decision not to convict him in 1970. But you've got to remember back there, you, if you were convicted of murder, the typical length of sentence served was about seven or eight years. I can't imagine in, in those days him serving more than 20 years. So the outcome for Mr Percy of a successful insanity defence was a catastrophe. So in effect, justice was done with this very pragmatic, flawed process. I think the final result was the right outcome. I don't believe Derek Percy killed nine children. The evidence is just not there. I think it's possible he killed three, and he also sentenced poor, brave Shane Spiller to a life of trauma and substance abuse. Percy was pure evil, and I hope the world never sees the like of him ever again. You've had the 
professional privilege, I guess I'll call it, somewhat dubious, of talking to some of the worst people in the Australian penal system, including Martin Bryant. How does Percy compare with the pantheon of evil villains in Australia? Uh, Justice uh, Bryant is, is special. Just as the Snow Time murder is a special. I mean, you know, there are certain crimes where you go, oh, that is so terrible. Percy was only 19 when Simon Rook was killed. He was only 19 when Linda Stillwell disappeared. He was only 20 when Yvonne Tui was killed. For a person to jump from fantasist to activist in such a short time, that's very rare. The horrific thing about Derek Percy is that, that we know what he was thinking and we know what he did. And we hope to God that there's no one else out there quite like him again.